One of the uh, great pleasures of uh, occupying those offices at a university like this is that I get to introduce uh, some of the uh, greatest uh, thinkers in the fields of uh, ethics and moral and political and uh, legal uh, philosophy, and that's always a joy. Uh, never more so than today uh, when I get to introduce three uh, people in those fields uh, whom I enormously uh, admire and uh, look up to. This is a real treat for me. And uh, for that, I uh, want to thank uh, our hosts for today, uh, the Anscombe Society. The Anscombe Society is a student society here at Princeton. It's uh, hosting this afternoon's event. Uh, you should have received cards on your way in, which will give you information about uh, how you, get, uh, how, how you uh, get access to other Anscombe Society activities and events, so I urge you to be in touch with the Anscombe Society if you're interested in these topics uh, at all. Well, uh, straight to the business of the day, and that's introducing our very distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, to my left, Roger Scruton is one of the world's most eminent philosophers. He's a specialist in the field of aesthetics, but has made important contributions to other fields of philosophy as well, including moral and political philosophy. He's the author of more than 30 books, including Art and Imagination, The Meaning of Conservatism, one that's today's discussion, Sexual Desire, and The Aesthetics of Music. In addition to his work in philosophy, he's a novelist and operatic composer. Professor Scruton was a lecturer and professor of aesthetics at Birkbeck College, London from 1971 to 1992. He has since taught at Boston University, the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C., and the University of St. Andrews, and here in Princeton as a visiting professor in the philosophy department where he taught conservative political philosophy under the sponsorship of the James Madison program. In 1982, Professor Scruton helped to found the Salisbury Review, a political journal which he edited then for 18 years. In 1987, he founded the Claridge Press. He's a member of the editorial board of the British Journal of Aesthetics and is a senior fellow of the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, DC. In a life filled with achievements, it's not difficult to imagine that among those of which Professor Scruton is proudest, is his role in establishing underground universities and academic networks in Soviet-controlled Central Europe. These institutions and networks helped to place Soviet communism on the ash heap of history. Candace Vogler is professor of philosophy at the University of Chicago. Her fields of scholarship and teaching are moral philosophy, action theory, the theory of human action, of agency, social and political philosophy, and sexuality and gender studies. She has a special interest in English literature and literary theory and did her doctoral work at the University of Pittsburgh in cultural studies with emphasis in 20th century French thought. She's worked on the thought of Karl Marx, Thomas Aquinas, John Stuart Mill, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Elizabeth Anscombe. She's also been a very powerful advocate for liberal arts education and its value in teaching students to be critical thinkers. From 2004 to 2007, Professor Vogler was co-director of the Master of Arts program in the Humanities at the University of Chicago. She's the author of the book, John Stuart Mill's Deliberative, Deliberative Landscape, an essay in moral psychology, which was published by Routledge in 2001, and Reasonably Vicious, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2002. She serves on the editorial committee of the scholarly journal Public Culture, and among her current projects is editing the Oxford Companion to the Thought of John Stuart Mill. John Haldane is the J. Newton Razor Senior Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at Baylor University and also holds an appointment at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland where he has been for many years University Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Center for Ethics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs. Professor Haldane is one of Britain's leading public intellectuals and frequently appears in the public media, television, radio, newspapers, to discuss morally charged issues of culture, politics, and public policy. He has a, an extraordinary gift, a charism, uh, for making philosophy uh, intelligible uh, to ordinary people uh, in circumstances where thinking philosophically can help us through uh, difficult, controversial, uh, moral and political uh, questions. He's also an important contributor to discussions of art, uh, art history, 
and art criticism. In 2004, 2003, 2004, he delivered the prestigious Gifford Lectures at the University of Aberdeen. He's held many honorific fellowships and is the recipient of honorary degrees from the University of Glasgow and St. Anselm's College. He's chairman of the Council and of the Executive Committee of the Royal Institute of Philosophy. Professor Haldane received a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from Birkbeck College of the University of London and a PhD in Philosophy also from the University of London. He was a student of Roger Scruton. <laughs> we begin with Professor Haldane. I feel I've been set up for a fall doubly there. <laughs> um, the, uh, in the, um, well, first of all, let me say uh, that I'm very pleased to be here. I'm grateful for the uh, invitation and the opportunity it provides to discuss some of these matters. Um, particularly pleased uh, that the Anscombe Society uh, is flourishing, um, that it's reached, I think, its 10th year. Um, I should, in that connection, by the way, just mention for those of you who are interested in uh, Elizabeth Anscombe and her work and her legacy, uh, that several publications will be coming out over the next three or four months. Uh, most immediately, um, next month, the uh, fourth volume of writings by Anscombe, uh, entitled Logic, Truth, and Meaning, and then in the new year, uh, there will be a special issue of the American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly on Anscombe. Uh, there will be a little later than that, uh, another book uh, on the moral philosophy of Elizabeth Anscombe. And a number of her previously unpublished papers will be appearing in philosophical journals. So this is a good season uh, to be celebrating uh, Anscombe. Now, in the uh, invitation, along with the invitation order, subsequent to that, what typically happens with these sorts of things is you get the invitation, that sounds fine, and then you get a, a further letter that starts to specify the conditions. Um, <laughs> now, the conditions in this particular case uh, involved an outline as to what the three of us might possibly uh, discuss, and uh, it was suggested that Roger might, uh, Robbie George made reference to Roger's very fine book on sexual desire, that he might have something to say about the philosophy of sex, the ethics of sex, and so on and that uh, Candace Vogler might say something about uh, how we got to where we are today, in some interpretation of all of that. But I was then left to say pretty much um, everything that needed to be said about the nature of the universities, their role as moral authorities, uh, the condition of higher education in the present age, uh, what hope there is for moral formation under these conditions, and so on. And so it, it occurred to me that really, um, uh, I, I could almost dismiss my colleagues and just be given the hour to try to engage those topics. But since uh, you wouldn't want that, and I certainly don't want that, it's going to be somewhat briefer. Um, so let me say something about, uh, and by the way, included in the list was, what does Thomas Aquinas have to say about these matters, and is it relevant to the present day? Um, so let me begin uh, with Thomas Aquinas, uh, the great uh, uh, Thomas. Um, regarding education uh, as such, since education is partly what I'm going to be discussing, um, he doesn't directly have a great deal to say. Um, there is a work, the De Magistro, that is sometimes attributed to Aquinas. Um, there's no doubt that he is the author of that text, but it was never intended as a text as such. It's in fact a selection of questions from a larger body of questions, the De Veritate, questions on truth. But um, the followers of Aquinas, not to be outdone by the followers of Augustine, because Augustine did write a work called De Magistro, uh, the Thomists were pretty sure that Thomas must have done so as well. So they simply list, lifted uh, a set of questions from the De Veritate and called these his treatise on uh, education or on the teacher. Well, in fact, they're not that. Uh, the sole text that I know of in which Thomas addresses questions of educational formation particularly with regard to students and so on, is uh, something that some of you may know. It's a very short text indeed. Uh, it's the letter uh, to Brother John uh, on the method of study. So let me just um, uh, let you hear that in its entirety. He says, because you've asked me, my Brother John, most dear to me in Christ, how to set about acquiring the treasure of knowledge, this is the advice I pass on to you that you should choose to enter by the small rivers and not go right away into the sea because you should move from easy things to difficult things. 
such as there for my advice on your way of life. I suggest that you be slow to speak and slow to go to the room where people chat. A chat room, probably, uh, in this rather loose <laughs> rendering. <laughs> It's a slightly different connotation. Embrace purity of conscience. I want to come back to that. Embrace purity of conscience. Do not stop making time for prayer. Love to be in your room frequently. I think really sell almost. If you wish to be, um, if you do not wish to be led, to, or, or if you're liable to be led to the wine cellar. In other words, lock yourself away from that. Show yourself to be likable to all, or at least try, but don't show yourself as too familiar with anyone because too much familiarity breeds contempt and will slow you in your studies. And don't get involved in any way in the deeds and words of worldly people. Above all, avoid idle conversation. Don't forget to follow the steps of holy and approved men. Never mind who says what, but commit to memory what is said that is true. Work to understand what you read and make yourself sure of doubtful points. Put whatever you can into the cupboard of your mind as if you were trying to fill a cup. And here he quotes from scripture, seek not the things that are higher than you. Follow the steps, he continues, of blessed Dominic, who produced useful and marvelous shoots, flowers and fruits in the vineyard of the Lord of hosts for as long as life was his companion. If you follow these things, you will attain to whatever you desire. Farewell. Now, um, an aspect of that that I do want to uh, return to is the idea that's um, contained within it of a purity of heart and the idea of um, what may be necessary for the formation of purity of heart and for its retention. Uh, but first of all, I, I want to take up one of the tasks that I was charged with, which was to say something about um, uh, the role of uh, higher education institutions as uh, moral authorities, uh, to the extent that they may have such a role. And I think here, the, the best way to, to try to address this, uh, fairly briefly really, is just by making some uh, historical remarks. Um, I think that, I mean, many of you will be familiar with the brief history that I'm about to give, but it is worth having it uh, to the forefront of our minds because I think that people can easily forget uh, how, quite, how very recent is the phenomenon of higher education as we have it today. I mean, it really is a post-war, post-Second World War phenomenon, mass higher education. Um, the ancient universities, I'm not now going to talk about the medieval period, but if we just leap forward to the, 17th, the end of the 17th and into the 18th centuries, those uh, universities in Scotland and in England were really rather like high schools. I mean, the um, uh, students were quite young. Uh, when David Hume, for example, completed his education at Edinburgh, I think he was 14, um, which gives you a sense of, of what we're dealing with. The numbers were very small, and quite often they operated something like a regenting system. <coughs> So in the regenting system, a single master would be responsible for the education of a group of students, might be 12, 13, 14, 15 students, in all of their subjects. Now, of course, that's entirely impossible today, given the ramification of knowledge, specialization, and so on. But in those days, it was still possible, particularly since we were dealing with a level that would not correspond to what we would today call anything like advanced studies or even uh, university studies. Um, Research was no part of the function uh, of, of universities or colleges. Um, and indeed, it's worth saying they were typically called colleges. Even the University of Glasgow, which I think is the third old, fourth oldest university in the English-speaking world, was until the 19th century known as, as the College of Glasgow. Uh, the term university was not generally used, although it was, strictly speaking, a university. Um, there were small institutions in which the masters were charged with the formation and education. Those masters were typically, not invariably, but typically clergymen. Um, and if they were in England, they would be members of the Church of England. Indeed, access to universities was forbidden to people who were not communicants of the Church of England. If it was in Scotland, they'd be members of the Church of Scotland. In fact, even in the United States, John Dewey said uh, in one of his autobiographical essays that he belonged to the last generation who'd been taught by Scotch clergymen. Uh, now, in fact, he hadn't been taught strictly by Scots clergymen, but what he meant was that the, 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 the liberal arts education, the liberal co arts colleges in the United States were really modeled on that kind of uh, historical uh, precedent. Small institutions teaching a fairly well-established core curriculum um, 
in relatively small numbers under the direction of masters who would often teach more than one subject, but often themselves be um, clergymen. Now, interestingly, Newman, when he uh, produced his university, his lectures and discourses on higher education, one set of which become the idea of a university, when he talks about university education in the middle of the 19th century, he says that um, universities should be uh, concerned to inculcate a certain, certain intellectual capacities uh, to, for, to enable uh, students to have a certain comprehension of how the different elements of human knowledge stand in relation to one another and so on. But he says there are two things that universities should not be concerned with, and this may surprise us in some ways. The first, perhaps not, but the second, certainly. The first is that they should not be concerned with the extension of knowledge just with this dissemination. He didn't think it was the business of universities to engage in research. Um, he didn't think that research was something that shouldn't be done. It should just be done in research institutes. They could even be on what we would now call the campuses of colleges, but they would not be part of uh, the uh, undergraduate education, and the people who engaged in undergraduate teaching would not themselves be researchers. The other thing, more surprising perhaps, is um, that he didn't think that moral and spiritual formation should be the business uh, of undergraduate education. Now that might seem rather surprising coming from somebody like John Henry Newman. Again, however, it wasn't that he didn't think that moral and spiritual education should go on, but he thought those should go on within another context. What he was really trying to do was focus on the central role of, of um, university education in the classroom, which was the inculcation of a certain understanding of things. And he thought that research was something that mattered at one side. He thought that moral and spiritual formation was very important, but that should be conducted in chapel uh, or through, um, uh, through particular kinds of, uh, of uh, provision of, of religious uh, instruction and moral instruction. Now, look, here's the big change. Um, we inhabit a world now of mass higher education. Uh, it has transformed education in all sorts of ways. But one of the important ways in which it's transformed it, I think, has been the development away from disciplines through the medium of subjects into the field of studies. Um, and you can trace this historically, uh, and I think it's quite interesting, and it keeps pace with the ever-expanding scale of higher education. Now, one thing that happens in the course of that is that the norms and values and ideals that are associated with particular disciplines and with the excellences associated with them and with the canon, the literary canons and other canons of works associated with them is rather lost sight of when it comes to the level of subjects and is further lost sight of when it comes to uh, the field of studies. Studies take on a quite different uh, role, not the formation of the intellect, not the introduction to a set of ideals and principles and excellences, but perhaps an understanding of the uh, society that, uh, that we inhabit. And part of that understanding has been profoundly, obviously and profoundly, uh, informed by a set of views, a kind of set of hermeneutics, that derive in part from Nietzsche, in part from Freud, in part from Marx, which have in common a certain revelatory ambition that they intend, as it were, to strip away the uh, surface appearance of order to reveal certain forms of power as operating below that, to reveal the mechanics uh, of power. Now, when we turn to the area of um, sexuality and sexual ethics and, and understanding of sexuality, um, it's pretty clear that uh, in the older scheme of things, sex was understood within uh, a very familiar uh, scheme, what within, say, Catholic theology, gets articulated in terms of, it, of the unitive and procreative functions or character or identity of sexual activity, people largely didn't discuss that because it was simply taken for granted. It was part of the language and demeanor, and the approach, the way in which people carried themselves, that it was understood that sexual activity that was something that was conducted in private and so on uh, with an aim in view of um, uh, procreation and of within the context of marriage and so on. But that um, whole area of human life, along with other areas of human life, itself by stages became the subject of um, subjects and of studies. And those subjects and studies mostly saw their posture as being one of revelation and revolution, of uh, disclosing, as it were, the false consciousness 
that was associated with these earlier ways of thinking. First of all, bringing things to consciousness in the first instance, and then revealing that consciousness itself to be deceitful or whatever else it may be, and substituting in its place a very different way of thinking. Now, um, I think there are some aspects of this to which I will simply re I will return perhaps in discussion rather than taking time uh, now, but I do want to just um, mention two things briefly. Uh, one is by way of indicating where we've got to, though actually I think Candace is going to say more about that, and then the other one is just returning briefly to say, saying something about uh, purity of heart. As regards um, where we've got to and how rapidly um, things are moving, let me just mention uh, this. Um, <clears throat> about three years ago, in uh, Scotland and in England, and of course here in the United States this has been advanced as well, but the debates were going on about uh, same-sex marriage, its introduction, uh, whether or not pre-existing arrangements for civil partnership should simply be thought to be sufficient or whether marriage should be, uh, whether marriage should be provided also. And around that time, um, I found myself, as many others did, involved in public discussions of these matters um, on the radio, and television, in newspapers, and one thing and another, as well as in um, uh, sort of academic contexts. And um, I wrote something in sort of different versions appropriate to these different kinds of contexts, but in one of them I described it as kind of argumentum ad consummationem. And basically the argument here just goes something like this. This is the first premise. Sexual attraction and love are determinants of human happiness and should be consummated wherever sincerely felt. Second premise, you can't choose to whom you're sexually attracted and you can't choose with whom you fall in love. Conclusion, something like this. Whether or not they're chosen, attraction and love should be consummated where sincerely felt. And uh, the point was that this was meant to be a partial diagnosis of where, as it were, the culture had got to in thinking about these matters. I put this under the general title of the idea of erotic entitlement. I should say sentimental erotic entitlement. Now, rather on the strength of one of these articles, one of the British newspapers, um, this is often how uh, letters in, in British newspapers appear, the letters editor uh, of that newspaper contacted me privately and said, would I be willing to write a letter to the newspaper which they would publish the following day or the day after as their lead uh, uh, letter, which they print in bold and so on. And so I did, and that um, letter appeared uh, in the Daily Telegraph in 2012 under the heading, if a gay couple can marry, why not siblings? And... Um, I just quote a little bit of this letter. I just said, a consistent pattern of argument emerges from speeches of the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister. It's this. People who love one another, whatever their sexuality, should be free to commit themselves to one another, and society should value that commitment and honour it, not only value it, but honour it by making marriage available to them. And then I asked this question. In what particulars, then, would the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister dissent from the following. People who love one another, straight or gay, brother or sister, brother and brother, sister and sister, should be free to commit themselves, and so on. Um, a copy of that letter went to 10 Downing Street. Suffice it to say, no reply was forthcoming. Uh, however, last month, <coughs> Lord Lexton, a Conservative peer and the official historian of the Conservative Party, uh, stood up in the House of Lords, this is last month, and said the following. Is it not the case that in Britain today all other stable and loving couples are now able to formalise their relationships in legal terms, so vitally important where inheritance and tax implications are concerned? If sibling couples are to be denied civil partnerships, how does the government propose to address the injustice that will arise in consequence? Now, the point of this question, this is a parliamentary question, the point of that question by Lord Lexton was to put sibling marriage on the table, as it were, uh, to advance that as the next stage in this iteration. And actually, once you go to sibling marriage, there's no obvious reason why you shouldn't have parent-offspring marriage, for example. Now, I think that the context in which all of this makes perfectly good sense is what I call that argumentum ad consummationem. It is, I think, if you think of these things in those ways, very difficult to resist the argument that where 
attraction is felt sincerely and so on, where there's free choice in the matter, uh, where people feel that there are sexual identities and the expression of those identities central to their sense of their own worth and so on, and that they seek to be valued by others in society on the basis of their choices and so on, uh, then these matters should be honoured. Now, I, see, I mean, there's a lot to be said about this and we'll have an opportunity perhaps to discuss it, but I just want to proceed really finally to this. Part of what I think has gone wrong here is a breaking apart of really two aspects of morality. On the one hand, there are those aspects that relate to, as it were, will and emotion, or the affections, in which we propose certain ends to ourselves, certain, we have certain aims that we seek to pursue, we have certain things that we find repugnant or things that we find attractive and so on. That on the one side, and on the other side, uh, perception and reason. And uh, moral formation historically took the form of inculcating in young people, in children at home, but then at school and so on, certain virtues. Uh, I mean, the notion of virtue was really, it wasn't the only moral concept, obviously rules, obligations and so on, but it was very important in education to inculcate certain dispositions, certain habits and so on. But these habits brought together these two aspects of the world, moral subjectivity. On the one hand, emotion and will. On the other hand, uh, reason and perception. And I think one thing that's happened is that those have been split apart. So there's been a reconstruction of sexual ethics around the idea of emotion and will. And I think the argumentum ad consummationem represents that. And the disconnection of sexual ethics and thinking about sexuality from notions of reason and perception on the, one on the other hand. Now, there's a great deal more that could be said about that, but I just return finally to where I began, to uh, Aquinas' remarks to Brother John and the advice that he gives him there, and the importance of what I just call, as he does, purity of heart, something that he's taking out of the scripture. I don't think that the universities can any longer, nor, in a sense, ought they to attempt, to be uh, sources of moral formation of individuals. But I do think that within the context of universities, individuals should themselves seek one another out uh, and form groups in which they can contribute to one another's moral formation and seek the assistance of others uh, in, in that role. But I think that what needs to be central to that is the idea of the cultivation of purity of heart. And this, I think, involves a certain kind of humility a certain self-examination of conscience, a certain liberating of one, oneself from one's appetites, a relocating of those appetites within the context of a reasoned judgment about their role in life, and so on. That isn't going to be easy, but I think, in a way, the surrounding culture has become so antagonistic to the historical conception of these matters that either, as well, we head in that direction or we give the whole thing up, and in a way, in the circumstances of the kind of chaos that's represented by uh, uh, Lord Lexner, so it seems to me, in some ways it's easier now for people to say, well, look, you know, we've seen how this is going. We don't want to be part of that. We want to try to find a way through to a better conception of ourselves, of our sexuality, and the role of our sexuality in our lives. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Haldane. Professor Vogler. Thanks. That was beautiful. Um, I'm going to be down in Merck a little more than this. Um, my official charge was to say something about how sexuality and gender studies in the humanistic academy, it's different matter in the biological sciences division, we can talk about that if you like. In some ways it's worse, at least at the University of Chicago, but in the humanistic academy kind of got where they are, like what happened, and then where are they actually now, okay? And there's two prerequisites to understanding the place of sexuality and gender studies in the humanistic academy. One of them is a thing I think everybody in the room should take very, very seriously, um, which 
has to do, which emerged for public understanding, outrage, discussion, and so on, in the last half of the 20th century around things like civil rights movements. Okay. Um, when my mother was at university, there were no provisions to help fund women who wanted to go to university. Um, when I was, philosophy is still sort of a male dominated in like the 1970s sense of the term discipline. And when I was coming up through um, even, it was very hostile sort of place for female people to try to be um, in lots of ways. So there, were, there weren't women in a lot of fields. There weren't African Americans in a lot of fields. I mean, traditionally at Ivy League schools, there weren't Jewish people in a lot of fields. These, the horizon, people's horizons of possibility were pretty dramatically constricted given what we now take to be common sense morality and how things are supposed to go and so on. Okay, and so there's all of these uprisings that happen basically mm, around this, these topics, most notably in the last half of the 20th century. Okay, the second wave women's movement was one of them. Um, I am old enough to have been part of the second wave women's movement. I did that. Um, and it actually mattered to do that. Back in those days, I was at a women's college and we thought we were being radical. I mean, back in those days, if you were reading a newspaper article um, and it said a man did such and such, what it meant was a white man did that. Otherwise, they would say a black man or an Asian man or a Mexican man. There would be a modifier. If there was some article that said an artist did such and such, it was a white man. If it was a female person, it said a woman artist did such and such. And so those of us at Mills College who thought this is a little odd tried to like flip it around and so we spent a week, um, when we said artist, we meant either a female person or a non-white person or somebody who was both. When we said philosopher, we meant either a female person or a non-white person or somebody who was both. And we would use man as an adjective modifier in front of everything else. And we did that for two weeks and were stunned at how different everything looked. Right after, but that was back, you know, early 80s, late 70s. That counted as huge back then. So one of the things that you that lies back behind sex and gender studies as it is now and as it developed in the academy is an actual change in an understanding of the character of social justice. And it's one that now informs common sense morality so much that I would be shocked if there was somebody in this audience who was thinking, how did a female person wind up with an academic post? How did a person with Jewish ancestry wind up with an ac We don't think that way anymore. That puts us in the minority of people who, speakers of English for almost as long as English has been a spoken language, something like English has been a spoken language. So that's a huge shift. That kind of common sense is now very widespread. And it is a shift that owes a lot to people struggling against conditions that were actually pretty awful for a very long time. Lots of violence, lots of economic, oppression, lots of real trouble, okay. And so one of the thing that's, things that started happening in the last half of the 20th century is that some of the people, some people squeaked through and wound up with academic positions. And they started in the academy beginning to address these things, okay. I'm assuming that everybody in this room thinks it's good that we address those things. It's good that people changed their minds so that they thought that it was possible that if two people were dating, one of them could rape the other. Or if two people were married, one of them could rape the other. It's good that these massive shifts took place. It's, that helps. That's actual 
as a kind of social progress that took place and made it possible for people like me to have jobs like mine and things like that, and about half the people in the audience to be in this audience. Okay. So the social justice piece back behind movements in academic sexuality and gender studies is part of the reason that we get accused of being hateful when we espouse other kinds of views. We get accused of being hateful because they line us up with the sorts of people who were doing very terrible things to one another back in the old days, right? Which were very long. <laughs> the old days are very, very long, okay? Okay. So that's one prerequisite to understanding what happened. You had a bunch of people, I think it's actually interesting, and this is another strand you can pursue if you were part of it, to think about the kind of movements and changes in thought that happen when the people who are making the changes in thought are often the people who were wounded, damaged, or broken by the things that they're trying to fight against. <laughs> okay, because that's also a piece that goes into this that's a separate sort of a matter. So, but the first thing to realize is the social justice background of all of it, which I think is messy the way the social background, justice background of anything is messy, but has honorable aspects to it. Okay. If you're wanting to be in conversation with people who wouldn't come to an Anscombe Society meeting, it's helpful to bear this piece in mind. The other thing, <laughs> That ha that's a prerequisite to understanding what's happening is related to what John was just talking about. And that is a severance in common sense morality. It's popular culture. This is not just some elite group. This is widespread. Between thought about gender, sex, sexuality, and human procreation. You might think, how on earth could anybody think that you could talk about gender or sex or sexuality or any of those things in human life without thinking about making more of ourselves. But that began, that tie began to be severed in people's minds. It partly began to be severed because it started to seem like whether or not the sort of intimate interaction, sexual congress you were having with another person was potentially the kind of thing that could produce children or pregnancy could result, was something that maybe you had a choice about. Like maybe you could make that stop. You could cut out that bit. And as that became more and more and more the way that people started to think about their sexual lives, it seemed more and more and more like, well, you know, with man, woman, sex, pregnancy is a thing that could occur. Not necessarily. I mean, if that's what they want. Or I mean, for my students, what it means to be sexually responsible is to contracept. For my students who are involved in man-woman partnerships, that's what they think being responsible is. And it's what they were taught by their parents. That's what it means to be a responsible sexual being. OK, I have a very different view. But um, the thing to notice is that once that tie is severed, once you're no longer thinking, oh, sexual dimorphism, gender dimorphism, man, woman, we're a species that reproduces sexually. And that's the root of these kinds of things. And it's the root across a tremendously wide range of cultures. Okay, this is not some like little bit of local color. Okay, this is where everybody in this room came from as far as I know. I mean, clones. Anybody get cloned instead? No. It's very, very common, OK? Um, once you tr start thinking about gender apart from that, once you start thinking about sex apart from that, once you, part, <coughs> once you uh, 
adopt the, once you actually go contrary to Michel Foucault and suppose that there is such a thing as sexuality that can be predicated of individuals, that this isn't just a peculiar sort of a construction that happened under peculiar circumstances having to do with the need to control populations or something, right? When all that has taken away from the business of the reproduction of our species, anything can happen. Almost anything goes. Gender, my gender no longer has anything to do with whether or not I'm the sort of human being who could get pregnant. So what does it have to do with? I mean, maybe, there, maybe if I was a cowgirl, that would be a, its own gender, right? Maybe if I was a this or a that, that would be its own gender, right? I mean, so you get this incredible sense that these terms are utterly plastic. They're picking out something about the way in which you're being embodied in a social world, but that something is no longer in any way tied to things like families, or future generations, or past generations, or anything. When you cut that, then, you know, almost anything goes. So that's one big piece of the background for the way that things have gone in sexuality and gender studies in the Humanistic Academy. Okay. The way that that gets described nowadays in a lot of the humanistic academy is in terms of L, B, <laughs> the LGBT issues, where the first three are supposed to be names of um, marginal sexual orientations or sexuality, lesbian, gay, bisexual. These are supposed to be kinds of human being, <laughs> right? Um, and then the last one, T, is um, I think in some ways the saddest of them. I mean, because it, it ordinarily um, deeply, re, deeply appropriates sexual dimorphism, gender dimorphism as sexual dimorphism in a very deep way and then in ways that are, can be very, very painful and difficult for people who understand themselves as being in that category. Right. We can talk about that if you like. But what's going on throughout all of this is really just a refusal to think, as near as I can tell, or as near as Miss Anscombe could tell, sex in its place in ordinary human life, the kind of thing sex is for human beings. Okay. If you agree that the kind of thing sex is for human beings is rooted in the understanding that human beings are a species that reproduces sexually, then a lot of stuff about gender and sex and sexuality comes right with that for you. If you try to prize these things apart, all kinds of stuff happens, okay? The place where, um, there's two places where uh, the really hot new stuff is happening. Um, one of them has to do with trying to think about transgender situations. There's tons of research on that. There's a new TV show. There's lots of stuff on that that's happening. Um, and the other is this very peculiar place if you came through the, the second wave women's movement like the gray-haired lady at the front did, um, which is in this thought that somehow the problem is that, that women are the ones who get pregnant. And like that's a big problem because we normally get pregnant at a time when we've got to make all kinds of major decisions about our future prospects and plans and all this kind of stuff. So there is once again an attempt to try to think about whether you could do it without wombs 
somehow, <laughs> right? Like maybe that's the problem. Maybe the problem is that as a female person, a young female person, I might find myself in a position where my life took a shape that was very far from anything I imagined or something because I was the kind of human being who can get pregnant. Maybe we should do something about that. It's funny if you came through the second wave women's movement because there was a book written in the early 1970s by somebody called Sheila Mayeth Firestone called The Dialectic of Sex, which basically said that, that what feminism really needed was to figure out a way around that uterus thing. <laughs> like that was the problem, that we are the ones who carry and bear children is the problem. And we need an alternate technology if we really want to be completely liberated people or something. There's an element of that that's actually weirdly enough coming back. But it's, which is this odd backhanded, strange sort of acknowledgement that an awful lot of the way you think about sex and gender finds its proper home in the place that sexual activity has in the lives of our species a species that reproduces sexually, okay? So two ways we got here, one, injustice, people didn't like it. Two, cutting the tie between these topics and thought about human procreation. That cut is so deep that I have very dear friends who are scholars of medieval English literature who have to explain to the students when you're reading Chaucer and people are thinking about having sex, they're thinking about something that could result in a child. That that's the thing they're anticipating in this act, is that it could make a baby. Like he has to explain this to actually fairly bright students at the University of Chicago. These would be the same sorts of students that I'm, I teach in the gender studies faculty. I've often taught Anscombe and contraception and stuff as part of the gender studies theory course at the University of Chicago, which means that you get these wonderful papers about that weird Catholic idea. <laughs> like those Catholics are so strange. They think some sorts of sexual congress produce children. <laughs> Hello? Who ever heard of such a thing? I patiently explain it's not a Catholic view. <laughs> you know, remind us where we all came from and so on. But there, um, but that's the degree to which this is not a part of the way that a lot of your fellow students are thinking about their sexual lives anymore. They really aren't <laughs> thinking about it in that way. And some of the problems that you face trying to talk with them have to do with the fact that this tie has been severed in an awful lot of common sense. That's what I have for you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vogler. Professor Scruton. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Anscombe Society for inviting me. Uh, I, I actually was taught by Elizabeth Anscombe. Uh, that's to say, when I, when I was doing research at Cambridge, I was assigned to her, and she did a, agree to come and talk to me in my rooms, provided there was a box of large cigars and a bottle of claret. <laughs> and, um, she would get through most of it uh, on her own. Uh, and sometimes there was an, a flow of wisdom from her. Other times there was silence. But her silences, which could last for half an hour, uh, were so pregnant um, that you, you actually felt that you were learning something from them. Uh, and um, I, I, it, she has implanted in my mind the image of the wise woman, which has remained there ever since. Now, that obviously suggests that I'm really quite old, uh, and it is true 
But I was brought up in a, it, it, I'm a member of a different generation from most people in this room, uh, and in particular, I'm obviously somebody who was born in the, in the last war and belonged to that baby boom generation, which was the first really to encounter the full force of sexual liberation. Uh, Philip uh, Larkin, the poet, says that, wrote famously that sexual intercourse began in 1963 <laughs> uh, um, between the Lady Chatterley band and the Beatles' first LP. Um, well, that um, too late for me, he added. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that's about right. Uh, that was our generation. And when I went up to Cambridge to, to, as an undergraduate, uh, it was a place which had no, virtually no women in it. Uh, um, as Candice has said, this was the very new thing, that women should be part of a university at all. It had a couple of Victorian colleges for women, uh, but um, you know, they didn't suffice um, for the number of men available. Uh, and of course, the, it was a, very much an upper class place. I, I was um, an odd man out in every way. I was abnormal, seriously abnormal. I was, for a start, not a socialist. Um, <laughs> I, I was lower class. And worst of all, I was heterosexual. You know, that, that meant that I was abnormal in all matters to do with social advancement in the university. <laughs> um, and I remained like that ever since on the, on the margins of the academic world, trying to find a little place of my own which would give me a voice. Uh, and uh, uh, in a way, I found it, uh, partly through this subject of sex. I thought that, that was the thing that like everybody in my generation, I thought about all the time. And to, uh, to as it were, rid me myself of this obsession, I wrote a book about it. Uh, and um, I recognized in writing this book that, that, of course, the problem of sexual conduct on the campus is by no means a new one. It began with, with Plato, who invented the university after he invented the academy. And Plato had the great problem that all teachers have which is what to do about those students who attract you. Um, uh, th this is something, that, as Plato said, that the, 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 the whole exercise of teaching and learning is erotic in the Greek sense that it's, it's putting you, uh, the, one person in front of another in a way which automatically leads to the kind of electricity that passes from one to the other. How do you overcome this? Um, or should you overcome it? And Plato, I think, was the first person to recognize that this problem had to be overcome if education was to proceed. And it, it was a, it, you overcome it by sublimating your desires. Uh, the, the teacher, uh, instead of um, wanting to unite physically with the beautiful boy whom he's trying to instruct, uh, instead, as it were, sees through that human being to the, uh, to the world of ideas uh, which um, transcend the empirical world uh, and in, to which we are, the, the teacher is introducing the student. That, in other words, you, you, you uh, relate not to the beautiful boy but to the idea of beauty which he exemplifies and you gradually abstract from any of the temptations that lie before you. Well, that, that idea of sexual education uh, which Plato introduced, is probably one of the most famous that we know. Uh, it was the norm in, in, in all schools and universities throughout Christian culture that sexual attraction exists, uh, but in all normal relations other than marriage, you sublimate it. And that's especially true uh, of the relation between uh, teacher and, and pupil. Uh, and I suppose that, that, has, uh, that uh, was accepted until, uh, certainly until the, the last war. But as John Haldane emphasized, the growth of higher education as a, a, a milieu and a, and a way of life in itself only really began then after the Second World War. And now we have these extraordinary institutions like this one in which uh, young people, a great many young people are brought together uh, uh, and uh, expected to get on together and given no particular guidance as to how their sexuality should be dealt with. 
Uh, we, nobody wants to enforce a moral code. Uh, and uh, at the same time, um, there are things that go wrong, things that go radically wrong. And indeed, if you read the uh, literature uh, of the, that's emerging from the American campus, it, it, makes it often makes it look as though sexual predation is what it's all about. That uh, we read about the so-called rape culture which prevails on the campus. And uh, I look back at, at my student days uh, and uh, find nothing then that corresponds in any way to the rape culture. Uh, everything that happened, uh, happened in a completely different way. So what, what does this all mean? Uh, uh, in the, the 1920s, uh, in the time when Americans actually were able to uh, approach sex with a sense of humor, uh, James Thurber wrote his famous book, Is Sex Necessary? Uh, trying to point out uh, that uh, people had become completely uh, misled about sex by reading Freud. Uh, they had come to see uh, sex in a completely different way from the way their parents had seen it. Uh, in particular, uh, the Freudian uh, myth is that sex is really about uh, pleasure, pleasure in the sexual parts. Uh, and th that's really all that, that it, that's the, the, it's the infantile pleasure principle that dominates uh, the adult life as much as the life of the child. And that modern view uh, of sex gradually spread and I think has become a sort of orthodoxy. On this view, sex is about sensations. As both uh, Candice and John have said, that the future generation has been cut out of the consideration altogether. Sex is simply between you and me, the, uh, us who live now, and it's about what we can do to obtain uh, good sex uh, out of each other. And good sex meaning the right kind of sensations in the right kind of places. And that idea um, has, was propagated as a kind of official doctrine by Alfred Kinsey in his so-called reports on uh, unto human sexual behavior, which uh, I, I think affected not just people's way of thinking about sex in America, but what they actually went on to do. Uh, and my view is that uh, that way of thinking is completely wrong. It's not wrong just for the uh, reasons that we've already heard, namely that it cuts the future generation out of the deal altogether. It's wrong more uh, in a deeper way in that it misplaces the actual experience of sexuality. If, if, if sexual desire was just a desire for sensations in the private parts uh, that could be accomplished in whatever way you choose, with whatever object you choose, if it was just like that, then rape would be as bad as being spat on. But it wouldn't be any worse. Um, because that, I mean, you know, just being touched in the wrong way at the wrong time by the wrong person. Uh, and uh, yet, of course, it's not like that. Rape is a violation second only to murder in the list of crimes in all traditional societies, uh, which has a kind of existential meaning. The victim of rape is somebody who has been negated in her very being. How can that be so if, if the matter at hand is merely a question of sensations? Uh, and another way of looking at this is to acknowledge that there can be such a thing uh, as a mistake in, in, um, in sexual um, behavior. The, the story of Tarquin and Lucretia is very uh, revealing on this a story for, uh, um, from, from Roman literature, which was made into a beautiful poem by Shakespeare but also it's an opera by Benjamin Britten. In Britten's opera, Lucretia um, wakes in the middle of the night to find herself embraced by uh, the, ma the man she thinks to be her husband and responds to his kisses with warmth and, and desire. And only then realizes that this is Tarquin, uh, the, uh, the rapist who's come to take advantage of her husband's absence. Now, what do we say about Lucretia's desire before that moment when she discovered uh, that this was the wrong person? Surely we say that it was a mistake. Uh, and her horror at, at, uh, uh, at her discovery is a revelation that what she was doing was not simply giving way to the desire for sensations, but offering herself, giving herself to another person to find only that she was, as it were, standing on a, a trap door over, over nothing and had fallen. 
And I think this, th those sort of examples illustrate to us the fact that sexual desire is not desire for sensations, it's desire for another person. And that person is seen as a person, as a responsible being like me, to whom I am uh, intending to unite myself and who, I hope, has the same intention towards me. That des desire, desire for another person, uh, is, belongs in the realm of interpersonal emotions and commitments, uh, and we have to get it right. If we don't get it right, then we are, in effect, courting all these dangerous existential conditions, that the, uh, such as rape and exploitation, the annihilation of the self in the sexual act. And I think um, th this is why uh, people have become so concerned about this in the American campus, because the ideology of Kinseyism and of, of Freudianism has removed uh, the natural way of understanding consent in sex. If consent is just consent to friction of a certain kind which produces pleasurable sensations, uh, then consent is easily negotiable uh, and doesn't require much knowledge of the object who's going to provide the, the pleasure in question. Uh, th there isn't that, uh, that giving of the self which is the normal precondition, was the normal precondition of sexual pleasure in the past so that uh, people have become confused as to what consent really is. But it's only if we understand sexual desire for what it really is that we recognize that consent is not the easy thing that is so often, it's so often supposed to be, but it is something that requires uh, the long-term relationship and the commitment which, uh, uh, without which you cannot give yourself to another person. Now that, um, and we see the result of this false view of, of consent in the accusations that are, seem to be prevalent on American campuses uh, of date rape, uh, sexual harassment, and so on, in which uh, consent seems to have been given and then was withdrawn in retrospect. Now that might seem like an injustice, but many women recognize that this is, this is entirely a normal procedure. If, if, if you say yes too quickly, yes doesn't actually mean yes. Uh, and you have been misled often either by the ideology of Kinseyism or by the, the bullying behavior of the boyfriend to, to say yes before you're actually able to know what yes means. Uh, and in particular, unable to see that yes actually means giving yourself. So that it's perfectly normal, I think, for women to feel that they have been abused, even though uh, they themselves, in some formal way, consented to the act. And I think this confusion that we see growing all around us uh, on the American campus comes very much from this misunderstanding of what sexual desire really is. Now, I don't think um, one can reintroduce the kind of understanding that our parents and grandparents had uh, very easily. For them, uh, sex was a forbidden region. It was something which you only entered uh, with a, tentatively and usually with the guidance of some religious authority or some uh, moral absolutes, which uh, kept everything, as it were, under wraps until the last moment. We can't, we can't be like that anymore. But uh, we can at least learn from our ancestors uh, one very important fact about sex, which is that whether or not we believe in, in, um, in a, any religious doctrine, whether or not we have a conception uh, of marriage which is confined to the, the lifelong association of man and woman, uh, whether, whether or not we include children in the equation uh, and the rest, we, we can at least recognize that, that our ancestors believed the sexual relation to be in some sense sacramental. It wasn't something that simply concerned uh, two ordinary animals uh, uniting for the sake of pleasure. That it, for, for our ancestors, it always meant it, it, the sexual relation always occurred, as it were, in full view uh, of the of the deity. There was a God's eye view of this, which is present in the very act itself. 
Uh, and even when people lost, as, uh, as they did in the 20th century, any lively sense of the presence of God in their lives, that this sense that sex nevertheless was uh, involved moving in to the God's eye view of things was still there. You see it in, uh, in 20th century literature about sexual relations very vividly. And I think we need to recapture some of that. We can't tell uh, young people today that they must believe in God or that they must uh, belong to a particular established religion or whatever it is, but we can tell them that in the sexual act they move out of their ordinary self, uh, uh, self-obsession uh, towards another person and that this involves moving into a, another region of the psyche uh, in which they are, as it were, uh, seeing themselves from a God's eye perspective. I think that's the, uh, the message I'd like to give, but uh, obviously uh, it's uh, up to my colleagues to dispute it. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Scruton. Uh, Professor Bergler, let me begin uh, with you, and then I have a question for John, and then one for Roger. But please, everyone, feel free to chime in on the questions, no matter who they're directed to. Uh, Candace, there were two points that you made that particularly interested me. One, I had some difficulty understanding, so I'm just seeking clarification on that one. And the second, I really thought was quite profound, and I'd like to hear you say more about it. Uh, the first, just to get the clarification out of the way, is your story about students at the University of Chicago needing to be informed by faculty members that sex, that coitus uh, produces babies. Since everybody knows that coitus produces babies, see, you can't mean that literally they don't know that. So, so I'm thinking that what you must, let me just say what I think you're, you're pointing to, and then you can tell me if I have this right. What has been lost and comes as a bit of a surprise is the idea that sex is oriented to procreation and that that orientation to procreation becomes a fact that's got to be taken into account in the moral evaluation of the, is that really what you were after? No, it's, I mean, that's of course what I think, but it's sort of. <laughs> Um, I think that the, the situation is a. Can you use? Oh, sorry. The situation is almost like a kind of repression. Um, they're um, they're so wedded to the thought that anything that comes of their sexual conduct with one another has to be something that they chose and wanted in advance and were seeking and so on. And they're so rarely engaged with each other in ways that they're hoping will produce the next generation, <laughs> that they sort of repress this. Um, so but I they'd mean, still make it a point to, to get the contraception so that they wouldn't get a baby. So they know exactly, a baby. No, of course. Yeah. And I always say that to them. I'm always yeah. like, uh, do you contracept? Yeah. <laughs> sort of like, then obviously contained in the way you're conducting yourself is deep understanding about the place of this act. But they don't imagine that wanting sex is wanting the act that has that place in human life. Yeah. So that's the thing that comes as a shock for them. That somehow, I mean, even when they're reading Chaucer, right, where this is just not the pill era yeah. here. Okay, so uh, my second, uh, the second point I found really interesting and quite profound was the point that you made, and I, I've, exp I've, I've talked to people myself and gotten this idea, this, uh, this reaction uh, from people, both men and women, that there's a, there's a problem to be solved about women becoming pregnant. Yes. That, that's, an, uh, that's an unfairness, it's an unfairness that's a product of nature, but it's nevertheless an unfairness, and what do we do about unfairnesses? We get them out of the way. Now, since it's a natural unfairness, the way you get that out of the way is with a technology. Now, the yeah. technology might be a very newfangled one, like an artificial womb, or it might be a very old-fashioned one, like hiring a poor Indian or Sri Lankan woman to provide the alternative womb, and then you just don't think about that. There's just a service provided, like getting gasoline in your car or, or whatever. And let me tell you what I think is so interesting and important about that. If that's right, and I think it has to be, at least in some, some people's minds, that, that is an attitude that some, not everybody, that, but some people have, I think what it reflects 
is an understanding of the self as something that is detached from or detachable from the body. That, that the body, even the normal functioning, natural functioning body, is not me. What I am is the psyche that inhabits and uses the body as a kind of instrument. And if, the, if, if there's a problem with the instrument, I, I fix the instrument because I'm, you know, the, 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 that's not me. So I can, I, can, I can get rid of the uterus problem and I don't change who I am. I'm still this, the same person I, I was. Uh, but if that's true, that gets us to this very interesting problem that at one point Plato uh, considers. Um, Although Plato himself, of course, embraces a kind of dualism, and, and, and diff different from a modern Cartesian one or some of the others that we encounter. But this idea that if, let's assume for a moment that I am my body and don't just inhabit it. I might be more than my body, but I, whatever else I am, I am my body. Yeah. If I want to alter that, so I want to, for example, get rid of my reproductive capability. Um, and I'm changing myself, then I'm trying to not be who I am. I'm trying to not exist as who I am. I'm trying to be a different person than I am, which obviously raises very interesting existential questions. Anyway, that's my thought. I started with you. I mean, it's, um, it's tricky, of course, because there, there are ways that people would remove things from your body that would be really important. <laughs> Mm -hmm. diseased limb or sure. something like that. So it's not, but what is... Um, but so, I don't imagine when, I, when I'm but, submitting to the amputation, I, I realize that it's a mutilation of me for the sake of the, the overall, sake of health, overall of the, health of the organism. I'm not trying to be somebody, I'd rather have the leg. Yeah, no, but if I have to give up the leg in order to preserve yes. the integrity of the, what's left, then I do it. Well, there's this, um, as near as I can tell, Gender dimorphism only makes sense in terms of reproduction, procreation, reproduction yeah, yeah. procreation. And, and gender dimorphism is deep. It's not a little thing. So it's not as though you can completely disrupt the operation of your reproductive organs and remain the man you are or the woman I am, like those it's not a part you can just, that doesn't have anything to do with anything else, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's really not like cutting your nails or having plastic surgery or something like that. I agree with you. You really are, and what you're doing is unsexing yourself. So you're trying to be uh, sexless in it, to the extent that it's tied to that part of human life you're attempting to be an unsexed human being, mm -hmm. yeah. which is a peculiar choice. Roger? Yeah, I, I was... Uh, uh, microphone there. Mm -hmm. um, the, this is a very interesting question, just what my relation to my body is. Um, I, I would hesitate to say what you said just then, Robbie, that I am my body. Uh, I would say that I am embodied, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, and um, but but when a, when a, an oculist looks in my eye to see whether the retina is deformed or something, he's looking. He's certainly looking at my body. But when my lover looks into my eyes, she's not looking at my body. She's looking at me. You know. Uh, uh, um, but they're looking at the same thing. Uh, uh, but seeing it under in two completely different ways and I think we, ha we have to ho keep hold of that that we, we've, although we are, in, you know, we are composed of our bodies in, in, in some sense uh, when we are seeing each other as persons we are seeing the body in a completely different way from the way a doctor or, a, uh, or a, you know, an anatomist would, would this formulation be satisfactory that um, the doctor's interested in a technical issue about the physical aspect of you. That's his job. Your mother is not trying to glimpse something that is um, not physical. But your mother is looking at you considered as the psychosomatic whole. 
the, the, the body, mind, or body, soul, unity, that is you. So she's still looking at your body because that, there is no you apart from your body. There, there, it's, it's, you're not a spirit that's inhabiting or a mind that's in, yeah, sure. inhabiting the body. So she's looking at you as the whole. Yeah. I, 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 microphone, Roger. <laughs> I just think these are incredible. Things go wrong because people use the long, wrong language. I think that what I was trying to talk about, the whole Kinseyist, Kinseyite approach to sex, is describing something using the wrong language. Uh, even though, of course, you're, you're referring to the right things, uh, it's like, uh, you know, um, the, how would you describe the difference between a mother's kiss of, um, planted on her child's face and a lover's kiss planted on his beloved's face? You know, uh, these are physically the same thing. But they're, of course, they're completely different things because uh, one is in implying a relationship that is not implied by the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we do this all the time. We, we address each other uh, in the expectancy that the, that the other is coming out towards us in a certain way and we towards the other. Uh, and if we get this wrong, that's when, when uh, all this all these problems about consent arise in, in, in sexual behavior, I think, because people come blustering towards each other uh, without any of these, the, the recognition that, that they must approach each other as dignified persons uh, in, in, uh, whose attitude has to be solicited in, a, in certain complex ways you know, uh, uh, and can't be just imposed upon. I thought the great insight of, of your book sexual desire, which you repeated for us here today, is the idea that what you are desiring is not sensations, mm. tingles, but you are desiring the person and desiring a kind of unity with the person. Right. And, and one, once that premise is in place, everything changes. The, the, the Kinseyite, the expressive individualist, the contemporary sexual revolutionary ideology of sex is completely thrown into question. Now. Yeah. Uh, John, can I, can I shift to you? Um, I mean, I'd like to go back to something. Do you, do you want to say, say, yeah, go ahead and say well, what you want to say that, and I'll get to my question about education. Let me say something, first of all, well, a couple of matters, actually, that have been touched on. Uh, one is, I mean, as Roger sort of hinted at there, there's obviously some very complex and delicate questions here around the metaphysics of the nature of persons. But what I think is not in dispute is that we want to say we're dealing with persons. So what I mean by that is, I mean, if we think of a philosopher like Locke, for instance, he was struck by the fact that there's a quantity of matter over there, there's a living animal over there, and there's a person over there, and then he's interested in the relationship between these different kinds of descriptions, and he thinks it's central to the notion of a person that there's holding responsible. Persons are the sorts of things that can be praised or blamed, accused, rewarded, and so on. Now, however we think of these aspects metaphysically united, it clearly is absolutely central to the views that we have, which may differ in some respects, but not only I think the ones that we have, but others might want to have, that what we're dealing with here is persons, even if that's to say this is how we want to describe these animals in terms of these characteristics and so on. What I would just say, however, is that somebody who's an advocate of a different conception of how we think of sexuality and so on needn't deny that. Because what they might say is that, yes, that's right, and what was important to see there is that we wanted to distinguish between persons and animals. Uh, so uh, just as we want to distinguish between the matter that I'm made of and the fact that I'm alive, so we want to distinguish between the person that I am and the animal that I am. And such, a per such a, an advocate might want to say that questions of sexuality, therefore, are not to be resolved biologically. They're not to be resolved by looking at the kind of animal you are. Uh, but by the kind of person you are. And so that's where I think, well, on the one hand, I think it's absolutely central and centrally important to see that we are here in the domain of persons. I think that that in and of itself isn't going to resolve the debate yeah. around questions no, of No, I certainly sexuality. agree with that, yeah. but it makes the debate possible. No, I it puts the yeah. Kinseyite view on the table for yeah. a question. 
I, I as opposed to being the established yeah. orthodoxy and you know you bow down before it. Sure, yeah. uh, I, I agree about that. But all I'm really saying is there is a way of kind of reinstating a different kind of dualism now, which is the dualism sure. between, as it were, sexuality and biology, if you put it that, put it that <laughs> way. Um, but I, the other thing I just wanted to touch on was Roger said, you know, he, he mentioned that in the past that um, the kind of teaching that people received was connected with a, a conception of the human as under the governance, a creature of God and under the governance of, of God and, and so on, and how that is something that we lost in the course of the 20th century, uh, though its loss began there before then. And then went on to say, we can't put that back, but we can perhaps look for some other things. But it does seem to me it's worth just exploring briefly the relationship between sex and religion. Uh, because I think it can actually be driven in, in two directions. I mean, often, and often by opponents of what we might think of traditional ways of thinking about sexuality, have seen uh, religion, as it were, as an obstacle to a true understanding. It's the source of the problems, would be the, the critic's view. But it seems to me there may actually be an argument for religion that starts in sex, as it were. And um, the thought here might be something like this, that uh, I think people are familiar with, uh, and Roger has written about this in, uh, very eloquently and with great insight, I think, in Sexual Desire and other writings, about the kind of frustration that comes with just the relentless pursuit of bodily pleasure. That This is something that is, and we know this actually, I mean, the, uh, very interesting the way in which I mean, this is just charted in the, uh, very easily documented, and you, you can just check this by just doing Google searches and so on, the kind of um, desire for more and for the transgressions to go further and so on. So uh, I, I hope I can just discuss these in this context, but you know, the, the interest moved from uh, ordinary penetrative vaginal sex through to oral sex, and now the big interest is in anal sex, and the way in which anal sex has become a big theme within heterosexual relations. Um, and this has been the subject of quite a lot of commentaries uh, recently, and one recent survey was suggesting that, you know, among people of a certain generation under the age of, say, 30, I think it was, or between 25 and 30, that 30% 30 of people who were sexually active were engaging in anal sex. Now, I have no idea whether those figures are correct or not, but what I do think that they represent is this sense of, as it were, pushing through the next boundary, one thing and another. Now, I think what is, uh, what's interesting here is the, something that we get in Augustine, of course, Augustine is often associated with a kind of repressive conception of, of sex in its place, and there's perhaps something in that, but remember, it's also in Augustine in the Confessions where he tells us our heart is restless, Lord. Uh, it, it, we only come to rest when we come to rest in you. And there is a sense of the desire for the other, which one might say is transcendent. That is, well, sexuality is connected to this. That we, we desire some kind of completion in the other. And this is why I think the notion of complementarity is important to this for the understanding and therefore the priority of the heterosexual over other forms of sexual activity. But the desire for completion is a desire for personal completion. It's a desire for a kind of personal unification. And one might say that in that, there is an intimation and a beginning of an understanding of the religious desire, that the religious desire is for a kind of unification. In the manuals on uh, what used to be called mystical theology or spirituality, it's very common to observe what's called the threefold way as being recurrent in the spiritual writers. And the first phase of spiritual development is purgation. The second phase is illumination. And Eastern traditions tend then to halt at illumination. But in the Western tradition, or not exclusively in the Western tradition, the third phase is unification. And this idea of purgation, illumination, unification, one can see in a way this is connected also to a kind of sexual progression, as it were, overcoming base desire as one seeks to understand one's sexuality and what sex is for. But then this itself is being ordered to a kind of unification. And this is perhaps being an intimation of that deeper desire of which Augustine speaks, our heart was restless, Lord, they remain restless until they come to rest in you, that actually one can, as it were, pass from sex to religion and actually see as it were, sex as a kind of root into, or an intimation of, a desire for a kind of unification that is the ultimate form 
of personal unification, which is a spiritualized form of, of unification. So it seems to me that those who are interested, if I can put it this way, in both sex and religion, uh, needn't be fearful that somehow religion is the enemy of sex. And this you might think that actually sex is a friend of religion and run an argument through in, in that direction. But I think you had something else you wanted to raise. <laughs> I, I did, and I do want to get to that. But now I want to say something about what you just <laughs> said. So uh, if, um, if the common morality shared by so many of the great traditions of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, some of the Eastern faiths is right, and the Kinseyite view, the expressive individualist, to use that term from Bella, view is wrong, just for the sake of argument, assume that for the moment. Um, it, it's an account of that would be that where fulfillment lies, an opportunity for fulfillment lies, is in conjugal union, a certain sort of comprehensive union that is, has its, its foundation, biological union of the sort that you know, is articulated in, in, in Genesis 2. And that is not just something that you get. It's something that you, uh, uh, together with your spouse, uh, create. And it is sustained, and the fulfillment is realized by way of commitment and hard work. Uh, and any desires that arise that are pertinent to the relationship have to come under the discipline of the kind of thing that the marriage relationship is. So you want your desires to be shaped by your commitment, the commitment of marriage, not the other way around. So if you get a stray desire, you're interested in uh, a one-night stand with someone you, you meet on a business trip in Las Vegas, your wife's never going to hear about it. You know she'll never hear about it. You're, you're safe. Uh, you still decline to do it because you, you, your desire to do it, and it, it is a desire, you feel it, you experience it, is placed under the discipline of the type of relationship that, that, that marriage is. Where then on this view where fulfillment is not available is where you're just seeking satisfaction. And that would be the critique of the alternative view that sees the quest as a quest for satisfaction that you may get, happen to get, out of one person forever in a permanent and monogamous bond, but you may not. There's no principled reason why it has to be one person monogamous any more than it has to be opposite sex or, or any, any, anything else. So you're, you're after the satisfactions. Now, the critique, again, from the side of the great traditions would be that's, that's a recipe for disaster because those satisfactions will never amount to fulfillment. You're, it'll just be Hobbesian, it'll be the Hobbesian picture of desire begetting desire. The, the transgressive will only require you know, further transgressions and further transgressions and you never actually get what's worth having which is, uh, which is fulfillment. Uh, what's that? Yeah. Uh, can I, can I yeah. say mm -hmm. something? Your voice is so good, you don't need a microphone. Uh, oh, yeah. Do I need no, a microphone? You, you yeah, need okay. one. It's a microphone. That's <laughs> I have one. Ray. What? He gets one of the pricey microphones. <laughs> the, the, um, it's not just a question that, that the reducing sex to the sort of Kinseyite thing, you know, it's the desire for a particular experience, and then you, you need always to enhance that experience. You've got to, you've got to get, have more and better the next time. It isn't just that. I think it is that, uh, that um, the one night stand experience is doing something which has repercussions afterwards. What Shakespeare means when he talks, writes about the expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. You know, that, that thought is a very profound thought. You know, that there is something else that we're expending. We're not just uh, wanting this pleasure in, uh, in the sexual part. Our spirit is inevitably involved because the, we're there face to face with another person who has got something of us which we haven't yet wanted to give. But uh, isn't that the insight that the Kinseyite, the, the, the businessman formed in the Kinseyite view? 
lax when he's in yeah. Las Vegas. Because he just thinks this isn't going to do anybody any yeah, harm. But lacking, I get some kicks and no harm done. Yeah, lacking insight in Las Vegas is the normal condition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but nev nevertheless, it, 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 one assumes that if, he, if there is no if there are no repercussions for him, psychic repercussions in himself, yeah. uh, then he is living at a lower level. Uh, there is something missing from his life. Uh, and okay, okay, it's hard to say this because in our non-judgmental culture, it makes it look as though we, um, equally imperfect beings, nevertheless are casting judgment on him. But I think that uh, we have to be prepared to say at some stage that there is a that there are higher and lower ways of engaging in uh, the sexual act. And, and, and this remains the case if it's the, not the Kinseyite businessman, but the Kinseyite couple. And yes. so they've decided, look, it's an open deal. When you're away, I'll get a visitor. And when you're away, you can visit whoever you want to in Las Vegas. And you know, no harm, right. no foul. But, but can I say what I mean, it seems, you know, one obvious response to that, well, what's wrong with that is this. Look, the process of maturation, uh, and I don't just mean the physical maturation, but as we're moving through the stages of childhood into early adulthood and then maturation beyond that, involves a kind of subsuming activities under richer and richer descriptions. And this is true of cultures as well as it is of individuals. And so um, one of the things that we do in learning language is learn, um, particularly say in the learning of verbs, for example, is learn ways of describing activities. Um, and as we become more sophisticated, more reflective, more insightful, we subsume these descriptions under richer, higher level descriptions. Now, this isn't just true in the case, for example, of something like sex. And in a way, everybody knows this. I mean, they wouldn't put it in the way in which I've just put it. But um, think of the fact that, for example, you know, if you have animals, if you have, um, say, stock, uh, as uh, Roger does with the farm and so on, but uh, if you just have pets and such like, you lay out their food in one sort of way. But the way in which you lay out your food for your children, uh, for members of your family, is quite different. You put it on a table, you expect them to sit down at a table and so on. So it's only really analogically that we can say that cats and dogs and human beings eat. Of course, it's true that they go in certain digestive mm -hmm. processes and so on. But we order our food within the context of a social form of living, right? And that's why we adorn our tables in certain ways and such like. But the eating of meals itself gets set within yeah. a, a broader context, a social context. And we have formal meals, institutions have meals and things of that kind. So there's a process of cultural development, both in the individual and in society at large, in which these things are taken up and placed within further contexts. And what happens in the, in the case of, say, a lifelong relationship, a committed lifelong relationship, is that the different phases of sexual appetite and its rising and its falling and its diminution and so on are relocated. They're not seen as were no longer as kind of disappointment. You know, if you take, for example, the complete obsession, which began in the United States, but I'm sorry to say is now with us in Britain, with, sorry to put it this way, erectile dysfunction. Um, this idea of sort of maintaining sexual activity, you know, all the way through into the later stages of life and something. There is something, it seems to me, infantile about that. It is a kind of regression away from a placing of one's relationship with another in the ordinary sequence of development of life into middle age, later middle age, old age, and so on. And that was understood, valorized, respected, and such like. But now it seems to be this kind of, it's as if we've sort of stripped away those richer understandings and are reducing ourselves to the, the status of the animal activity and so on. I think that's a genuine, uh, genuine impo impoverishment. I think the analogy that you draw with uh, eating uh, in drawing out the importance of uh, subsuming activity under richer and richer descriptions is a very uh, good one. We can consider, for example, that it's possible for human beings simply to feed or be fed just the way Cats can be fed or feed. But it's not possible for cats to dine, but it is possible for human beings uh, to, uh, to dine. You don't get a guarantee. Human beings don't dine just by eating. It, 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 it's something to be achieved. But here, I think, it, we get a really interesting question, because uh, you, you, you noted that 
individuals and cultures need to be about this process of subsuming under richer descriptions. And the, the point I want to make or question I want to raise is one about how difficult it is for the individual to do that unless supported by a culture that's doing that. Just take the eating analogy. You probably do not find dining in a culture that doesn't promote something like dining, that, that you know, hold up something like that. And, and it, without cultural support, people are just going to feed and be fed the way cats uh, are fed or, and, and, and feed. And it might be the same with respect to sex. Lacking a culture that promotes, upholds the subsumption of sex under richer and richer descriptions, it's going to be very difficult for individuals. The, the most individuals can hope for is sub-communities within the culture, especially if the culture's hostile, sub-communities that enable them to get the support they need to live out lives that would bring sex under rich and human descriptions, which is, I guess, what your plea was about when you said, well, don't count on getting universities back yeah. into providing that kind of cultural support, but there should be individual, it should yeah. be groups. Well, well, just two things about that. I mean, one is, of course, this suggests the analogy of, you know, the degradation of the whole structure of human eating or dining, as it were, uh, as represented by sort of fast food and takeaway and such like, yeah. and this being the a kind of analog of casual sex. So I think I don't want to, want to press that analogy too hard, far, but you might say there's a kind of similar regression as represented uh, by that. But the other thing I was going to say is, look, um, well, two things really. I mean, one is remember there are counter countercultural movements, um, and the direction uh, of countercultural movements needn't always be, as it were, in the favour of the transgressive. If I can put it that way, there is such a thing as as recovery. Um, and if you want to use the, the analogy of, um, of food, of course, if I think of Italy, for instance, the whole slow food movement uh, and this attempt to try to recover a sense of the value of the preparation of food and so on. But one thing I would just say, and this is really contrary to the way of conceiving of social and historical development that is, I think, very much in the mind of progressives and people who self-identify as such. Um, is this thought that it is just a sort of cumulative progress and that you know ideas will drive us there and so you get hold of the right ideas or you put those ideas in place in the minds of the Supreme Court justices or whoever it may be and that implements and finally completes the revolution. The real drivers of social history are events, um, famine, disease, war and so on. And these can happen very quickly and quite surprisingly. And I simply would put no bets at all on how things are going to look in 20 or 30 years' time. I agree. Yeah. Um, so I don't in any way despair, either because, of the, uh, because we can take an inspiration from countercultural movements, that's one thing, but secondly because history is not, I don't believe history is driven by ideas. I don't think there is any logic of history, any inevitability of history in that sense. I think that history is an attempt of human beings to try to recover from one disaster or mess after another. It may be warfare, it may be disease, it may be and so on. Well, I, I would, I would uh, dissent only because I think ideas do matter. Oh, I didn't, yeah. sorry. I, yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean, yeah, yeah, of course, Richard Weaver, you know, ideas yeah. have consequences. Yeah. Yeah, of course ideas have consequences. I mean, how we're going to react yeah. to the next major historical event will be shaped in part by what ideas right, are Right, but what I mean is how now. we think about sex is going to depend in large part on what happens next. Oh, sure. Um, and I mean, I'll just give you one instance of this, by the way, which is real. Uh, I mean, I don't think that the outcome is likely to be as I'm about to describe it. But just suppose, I mean, there's a whole question about what the sort of etiology and causation of homosexuality is and so on. But let's suppose, as um, may well be the case, that it's to do with phases of embryological development. It's not genetic, but it's, it may be connected with embryological development. We don't need to go into the details of yeah. the trial. It, it, um, it's a okay, but supposing it turned out that there was a diagnostic test, right? And suppose there was some therapeutic, or actually some preparatory uh, dietary or therapeutic treatment that could be taken that would, you know, counter or, mm -hmm. or uh, limit the likelihood of this embryological development occurring. I'm willing to bet, you know, a very large sum of money that if that diagnostic test became available, and the reason I say there is some circumstantial uh, aspect to this is that there are, there are people who are working precisely 
on, on this possibility uh, in South Korea and elsewhere. If such a diagnostic test became available, I would predict two things. One is that that testing would be rendered illegal in the United States. You wouldn't be able to get that testing done in the United States. But it would be online available, as all these things inevitably are, like DNA testing and so on. And people would be buying that testing pretty heavily. And so I think that, I mean, I, there, what, the point I'm making here is that there's a whole sort of ideological sense of a revolution having occurred. But I think an event could reveal the shallowness of that ideological I, revolution. I do think the evidence of history is on your side uh, as far as that's concerned. Uh, Candace, let me shift to you, but it's a question that really came out of John's presentation, but let me ask you about it. Um, the Anscom Society is itself an example of a, of a countercultural uh, movement and the, the other uh, institutions uh, uh, under the auspices of the Love and Fidelity Network at other campuses are, are uh, similar. But uh, what they find themselves up against is not simply universities that have decided, look, we're not in the moral formation business. We're going to take John Henry Newman's advice. We don't do the moral and spiritual thing. We permit there to be you know, campus ministries and, and groups representing different points of view and so forth. But you know, we're just into doing the reading, writing, and arithmetic stuff. And the moral formation and spiritual formation is not our business. That's not what they're up against. Uh, the sexual revolution has been extremely successful, and nowhere has it been more successful as an ideology than in the intellectual uh, establishment, and especially in the universities. So universities are in the moral formation business, but they're just trying to form people in a viewpoint. They're catechizing people in a viewpoint that's opposite to the one that's represented, for example, by the Anscombe Society, making it very, very difficult for uh, the countercultural movements like the Anscombe Society uh, to, to compete because the official institutions of the university, beginning with freshman orientation and going straight through what happens in the dorms as far as sexuality education and so forth, and in the curricula, uh, de departments of uh, sex and gender studies in general don't have faculty members with your open mindedness, <laughs> Candace, right? So, uh, it's, it seems to me a huge challenge because there's an alternative established religion. It's not that we've done away with established religions or don't demand that people belong to them. Uh, we just changed what the established religion is, especially in the, uh, in the universities. And, and that's, what, that's what students and parents and others are, are up against. Now, there, there still are the, you know, you're allowed to have the chaplaincies, and the chaplaincies can be, you know, Orthodox Jewish chaplaincies or evangelical Christian or Catholic or, or Muslim you know, faiths that hold to traditional ideas about sexuality and, uh, and marriage. But they're not calling the tune as far as the propagation of ideas officially in the name of the university is concerned, from freshman orientation through the curriculum. What do we make of that? With the microphone. <laughs> I mean, as, I agree that it's insane to think that universities aren't being involved with moral formation. They are. Um, and I uh, agree with you that the sort of moral formation that um, at least elite institutions like this one and the one where I teach are doing, involved in, runs contrary to the sort of views of the Anscombe Society. Yeah. I mean, I printed out the, the, uh, manifest, the little blurb from NYU on this topic um, that has this undergraduate program in sexuality and gender studies. At its core, the undergraduate program encourages students to question the meanings of, in quotes, male and in quotes, female, as well as of sexual norms in both Western and non-Western societies, courses seek to unravel the ways in which ideas about gender and sexuality shape social roles and identities, in addition to the ways in which race, class, and ethnicity function in the experience of gender and sexuality within a culture, blah, blah, blah. That's not a neutral statement. Um, part of the reason that I started by talking about injustice is that the 
only way I have to be charitable to the kind of thing that happens in places like mine is that people are really frightened, genuinely frightened, of um, injuring students, faculty, others, who don't fit, <coughs> who understand themselves as not having or finding a comfortable or natural place in the sort of world that yeah. comes to make sense to me. So that's, so what they're trying to do is make room for everybody. Right. Um, but they're, the attempt to make room for everybody, which is not a bad attempt in mass educational environments, right, um, is sliding into an ideology that has nothing to do with making room for everybody. Was it? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Candice that it, there is this, uh, uh, at least this view that, that uh, all, all the, these kind of courses are designed to make room for everybody, but they're much more importantly designed not to make room for people like me. Yeah. Uh, they are about excluding the enemy. And the enemy is the person who believes in those old-fashioned uh, prohibitions or who has some sense that there, that, that there is more to this than just doing what you want. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, I'm not a part of a university, but I, I, I read about it, and it's quite clear that, that the normal, natural member of the Anscom Society would be subject to pressure on a campus uh, and made to feel, uh, or made, or at least people would want him to feel ashamed of his values, you know, ashamed of being that kind of person who thinks he can't, he or she can't just go to bed with the, the, uh, someone on impulse. You know that that this is an offence against the the growing orthodoxy and the norms that that are going to be emerging. And I think that. Um, that is more important than the so-called inclusiveness, this, this uh, censoriousness towards the, the old way of seeing things. Yeah, uh, religions develop ways of dealing with, uh, with heretics, and um, uh, so do pseudo-religions. You know, whatever plays the role of religion, and where religions uh, have institutional st standing as established, um, the, the power of the, of the institution itself can be used to combat heresy. And sometimes that's formal, as you say, and sometimes it's just the ethos of the, uh, uh, of the place. The heretic is left in no doubt about his being a, a heretic and will be very reluctant to say very much that would challenge the established well, the heretic opinion. heretic is a threat. Yeah. yeah. Where, uh, Candace? I mean, I, what I have tried to do at the program at my institution is be very, very insistent on the idea that, yeah, there's room for everybody here. This is a, a university that has an aspiration to be providing educational, uh, educational resources to a vast variety of people. Yeah. Nothing about that says that people with views like mine are threatening, right? Yeah. I mean, there's no reason that I mean, if, if I was in the business of sort of asking your views on these topics and then filling out the grade sheet on day one <laughs> or something based on whether, then you could say I was abusing my position. But there's nothing about the kinds of views that people up here hold that is in any way about damaging, harming, injuring, or doing an injustice to anybody. Um, let's, uh, do, if we have a, a microphone out, or what, what, can we hand one of our, or I guess they have cords. Do we have a cordless microphone? Yeah, uh, let's, uh, no, <laughs> let's ask uh, students uh, for, uh, for questions. Who would like to ask a question? Yeah, right down here. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this is for Dr. Scruton. Um, I, I really love your line that sexual desire isn't a desire for a certain type of pleasure but a desire for another person. Um, but I, I do wonder what, what you would say to um, 
person who thinks that their desire is simply a desire for some sort of sexual pleasure. In what sense is their desire really actually a desire for another person and they should change their practice to fit with that? that that's, a, yeah, that's an important question. Uh, we have to recognize that, uh, that human sexuality is a malleable thing. Uh, the, the kind of norm that I'm defending uh, can be uh, marginalized, put to one side. People can, can reshape their sexuality so it does become a desire for sensations in the, uh, in the sexual parts. That, that's what pornography is all about, in, in effect. It's uh, about the instrumentalization of the human body. So it simply becomes a, a pleasure machine uh, and the other drops out of consideration as irrelevant. Or if, you, or if she's not irrelevant, it's an abuse of her to include her in the, in, in the fantasy. So, uh, so obviously, you know, there are, uh, I'm talking partly about a norm rather than something that, uh, that is a necessary part of all human sexuality. But, but I would want to say that the norm that I'm defending is one that leads to human fulfillment. Uh, uh, and that this instrumentalization of the body is going in the opposite direction. I think uh, uh, Robbie said something very good about instrumentalization of the, of the uterus. Mm -hmm. uh, using the, you know, that, that, that um, the Shula myth Firestone idea, I think it's Candice referred to that, 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 that the, a woman's body uh, you know, ha is being used uh, in the sexual act to produce children. You know, that very sense of, uh, you know, it's already producing this alienation between the, the, the self and the body, which is precisely what one ought to avoid. Roger, I wondered about that actually in reading the book. You, you mentioned that in the porn, of course, the norm, I gather, is the fantasy. Uh, to, wouldn't that itself be evidence that the, the person who's using the porn at some level is after more than just the tingles and chills? The, the, the person is at least fantasizing yeah. a relationship with a person. Not necessarily, yeah. uh, uh, because... Um, <coughs> We're talking about voyeurism, in which the other person is just a body, uh, ah. uh, and not, a, not an embodied person. There's no way in which it's necessary for the fantasy to know who this is, what she thinks, whether, whether she prefers Mahler to Shostakovich, for instance, which is a normal Yeah, there's, normal no, there's nothing that makes her an individual. I see your point. Uh, advance yeah. that I would make. Uh, yeah, you're not interested in her. Yeah, right. So the, the porn user is not interested in her as the distinctive person she is. Exactly. She it's is just yeah. physical. An icon yeah. of female uh, body. Desirable female, yeah. Uh, who, who, who else has a question? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. can you hand him a microphone over there? Um, <clears throat> this question is broadly to the panel, whoever would like to feel it, field it. Um, we talked about how academic institutions such as a university would attempt to maybe not have moral implications or moral education upon its student body. Do you visualize or imagine that that would be possible in any way as a university would be a collection of individuals who each hold their own biases and opinions and therefore is there any system which is actually physically possible where a group could not put some kind of bias or or oppression yeah. into like a group of students of no, moral. Uh, yeah, so no, I think of course this is true. I mean, the, the, you know, people might talk about here about implicit education, for example. Um, what I think is interesting about the contemporary university is the way in which it tends to be exercising something like collective consciousness in the, or the invocation of something like collective consciousness under the heading of what we think or what is thought. Um, and I give you an interesting example, or interesting to me at any rate, example of this. The university, uh, as Robbie George said, to which I've long been attached and remain attached, although I'm now uh, at Baylor also, um, the University of St. Andrews is a relatively, relatively speaking, uh, academically, cons academically conservative institution. What I mean by that is we don't, for example, have social sciences. We tend to have just, you know, what you think of the classical disciplines and such like. Um, 
but even in, so, so what I'm about to say now, if it, if it, the example I'm going to give there, you know, could be written much larger in other institutions, particularly city institutions and so on. But I mean, I think probably three years ago I taught a course on. Um, it's, I teach it every two, two years on social philosophy, which has a very large enrollment, probably the largest enrollment of a four, third and fourth year cl philosophy class. And um, uh, the, the occasion in which I taught it, not the last year, but two years before that, um, marriage was sort of on the agenda as one of the issues and, and relationships and marriage. And uh, in the course of that, I gave arguments on both sides with regard to things like same-sex marriage and so on, and encouraged students to take that on as an issue, to think about that and write about that. And students were initially a bit reluctant to do so. They weren't sure that they could do that, and was that all right? And I, yes, that was, that was all right. And here were readings you could take and one thing and another. And you could see there was a slight kind of anxiety. Um, but then once it was made clear to them, no, you know, there's no, there's no agenda here. You think what you think, read what you read, and so on. Um, that was fine. But subsequent to that, there was clearly a sort of sense on the part of people who took it to be their business that the question of same-sex marriage was not up for discussion. Uh, that's to say it was one of those topics that now should just be removed uh, from the syllabus of topics that can be discussed even you know, in a philosophy class. And to some extent, I see that issue also arising with abortion now. I mean, there are contexts in which I've heard it said by a director of teaching, for example, a university who organizes uh, teaching and so on, that abortion should not be on the moral problems uh, course, because it is no longer a moral problem. That's a problem that's been resolved. Now, this is, I think, is the invocation of something like what we think or what is thought. So that's not taking the form of, as it were, of in individual instruction. It's rather invoking this you know, group consciousness. The origins of that, I think, actually arise in agitation propaganda, and I think it's one of the consequences of the importation of Marxist theory and practice uh, into universities, particularly um, modern universities, I mean, recently founded universities, and particularly civic, city universities, um, which were also the main locus of the development of uh, subjects and studies. Uh, rather than disciplines and so on. So that's a, that's a, it's a very, so and, and I would say yes indeed, there is a kind of moral formation, but it's not education. These are not matters that are up for critical discussion. This is just a sense of this sets the framework of the kinds of things that you can then be taught or read or study and so on. At least that's one impression. And as I say, if that's true in an institution like St. Andrews, then it seems to me, you know, in, in other institutions, it's been like that for a long time. You know, John, you're bringing up that kind of academic Stalinism of trying to put subjects uh, that reasonable people of goodwill disagree on beyond bounds so they're no longer moral questions, so you have to take a particular view or keep your mouth, mouth shut. Uh, that uh, leads me to think, you know, someone we could have and perhaps should have discussed, and if the conversation could be longer and we're going to have to shut down soon, uh, someone we would be discussing is Marcuse. Uh, whose influence on the contemporary academic world, on precisely the questions we're talking about, sex in the academy, is really quite profound by way of trying to justify that kind of shutting down of, uh, of, of, of debate. So I wish we had more time to do that. On the uh, specific question that, that the student up here asked, I, I wonder if the panelists would agree with my own view, which I hold very strongly. I don't think neutrality is actually possible. In some places, it's not desirable, but it's not possible anyway. What I think is possible and in some places is desirable, and I think in this place, given the commitments of this university would be desirable, is pluralism. We can't have neutrality, but we can have pluralism. We can have faculty representing a range of different viewpoints. We can have, even in our orientation program, right? Why in our orientation program do students get the Planned Parenthood sex comic book and nothing else? What would happen if Anscom said, well, look, we don't, well, fine, you're going to hand out the, if every student, every freshman, you know, even a young Muslim woman who cares so much about modesty, she's got her arms covered to her wrists and so forth, is subjected to the Planned Parenthood sex book, but how about handing out the Anscom book as well that would provide an alternative point of view at a similar sort of level? Why can't other organizations that have points of view on this matter have their books included in the package? 
the play. If we're going to have the play, and if the play is going to be mandatory, why does there have to be one play that's supposed to combat um, uh, rape or sexual assault or sexual harassment that fulfills that requirement? Why not have different organizations, if they want to, offer their own, consistent with their own values, version of an event that different students could choose according to their own values or religious beliefs or perspectives that would fulfill the requirement. Why does, why does there have to be just one that everybody gets subjected to and that will therefore necessarily, to the extent that values are implicated, which they will be because there's no such thing as neutrality, the values will be the official values of the people who have control of the university. So I think, and this could be true as far as, as study breaks are concerned and who gets to address students at study break, right? If study breaks are gonna turn into catechism class, well why don't different faiths get to offer their catechism. Why should it just be the one official point of view? So that would, that would be my solution to the problem. At non-sectarian universities that proclaim that they are here to provide forums for a wide range of viewpoints, we can't do neutrality. We don't aspire to neutrality, but we can do pluralism. Roger? Yes, I, I think that's a very good point, but I, I would also add that there is a great difference between a discipline constructed around a, a set of intellectual questions from a discipline constructed around a set of ideological answers. You know, um, and what we are seeing is the growth of those second kind of disciplines and their dis displacement of the first kind. Uh, and um, you know, I'm lucky, we're lucky in that our disciplines are constructed around serious intellectual questions. Uh, and um, more and more, this is not the case. I'm very reluctant uh, to have to bring this to an end, but he who must be obeyed, Christian Say, says that we've more than exhausted our time together. I'm very grateful, Christian, to you and for the Anscombe Society. I know I speak on behalf of the panelists and saying how much we appreciate Anscombe <laughs> doing this.